States and was from South Museum. My name is Henry Kutcher. I'm uh, working in the museum for two years now, more or less, and I participated in the exhibition Mad Money, which is about uh, extractivism, especially in, uh, uh, in the middle of the South. And um, tonight we're going to have a talk, which is part of the Copenhagen program of uh, the exhibition. That's why I'm, I'm here. And um, we have a special guest. Um, Introduce yourself and your friends and family. So I will not say too much about it. Um, Vedek Up was uh, is, is a member of the um, United Liberation Movement of West Papua. Um, and he is leading the campaign in the Netherlands to promote the interests of this, uh, of this movement to make people like us know that it exists basically, because I don't know about it before. And okay, I mean, probably most of you did know it before because you're. I've seen many specialists in this topic already, but I think for many people it's, it's not, uh, not very common. So I hope that we're going to get some interesting information for this tonight. Yes. Thank you, Hendrik. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for having us, thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, my name is Uri Bekar. Before I introduce our, our, our team, uh, I would like to call my ancestor. This is the first time that I'm going to call my ancestor uh, using the flute. I just started to learn to play the flute, so forgive me if I don't play it well, but I try. It's my 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 uh, my, my way to to honor and call for support. I was normally I call them with my uh, my tifa, my sire. This is my uh, this is normally my my, my, my tifa. I normally call my ancestors by using this. Uh, ancestor, uh, I call them by using this instrument. We call it FIFA. It's a traditional drum. But tonight I will try to call them with using using this. It's also an instrument of us. Thank you. Uh, no, I don't play it, but it's just a Netherlands. 
I will always honor the struggle. Today I am here to represent our mothers and children who are forced to seek refuge in the jungle of West Papua. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Mr. Tommy, and I'm 39 years. And I'm from the Netherlands in the city of Denmark. And uh, how I become uh, involved with this? Because my father, he was a uh, South, it was the leader of the South Prophecy of West Papua, and now it's uh, one year has passed away, and I will keep his uh, spirit and spirit for the fight for my country. Thank you. Without any 
any uh, clear uh, uh, crime. Because he, because he was, he wasn't a criminal. He was a peace-loving guy who was making music, writing poets, telling jokes. Yeah. So this kind of man you cannot keep in prison. And uh, he had a lot of friends outside the club, and that that's why he he, he was a danger. He, he became a, a target, and he got killed. And you can look it up on the internet when you click down Arnold up, You will read how. Uh, who he was and why uh, he got killed by the Indonesian forces. And that's why for me it's an honor to, to sing songs uh, because uh, our songs, we tell the story of West Papua. Uh, we tell about uh, our happiness, about hope, but we also sing and tell about uh, the sorrow, uh, about the cry of our mothers. Uh, about the killing of our people. But we are not here to talk about me. Uh, I was invited to tell something uh, about uh, the Grassberg, about the mining problem in West Papua. So I've asked our team to, to prepare a short introduction video. Blood and gold from West Papua. West Papua is located to the north of Australia and just below the equator. It is home to 1.5 million indigenous peoples who speak over 250 languages. West Papua's biodiversity hotspot with over 70,700 species of flora and fauna, 32 million hectares of old crow tropical rainforest and mangroves, and one of the world's richest marine reef environments with 565 species of coral. Located on the western half of the island of New Guinea, West Papua is a militarized territory, the site of a long-term conflict between Indonesia and indigenous Papua seeking self-determination, the unfinished decolonization. After a little contact with the Western world, it was finally formally colonized by the Netherlands in 1898. The islands that now make up Indonesia were also colonized by the Dutch. But when the Republic of Indonesia became an independent nation state in 1949, West Papua did not join the country. The Dutch government recognized that West Papua was geographically, ethnically and culturally very different from Indonesia. So the Dutch government began preparing West Papua for its own independence throughout the 1950s. At the end of 1961, West Papua held a congress at which its people declared independence and raised their new flag, the Morning Star. But within months, the dream was dead. The Indonesian government wanted all of the former Dutch colonies in the Asia-Pacific region, and the Indonesian military soon invaded West Papua. Conflict broke out between the Netherlands, Indonesia, and the indigenous Papuans regarding control of the territory. There was an agreement between the Dutch government and the Indonesian government, the so-called New York Agreement, which was made on 15 August 1962. The indigenous Papuans were never involved in the decision making. A sham election with a pre-arranged end result took place in 1969, the so-called Act of Free Choice. The United Nations took note and the Indonesian annexation of West Papua was a fact. The Freeport Memorial Mining Company and the sellout of West Papua. Central to the conflict is the Grassberg Mine, located on the Melanesian section of the Pacific Rim of Fire. The mine contains the planet's largest combined reserve of copper and gold. Freeport's involvement in Indonesia dates back to the Suharto military dictatorship, which signed over 250,000 acres of West Papua territory in 1967. Freeport, the transnational company that owns and operates the mine, has been dumping vast quantities of toxic residue downstream into the rivers and the sea perpetrating an environmental disaster. The company has controversial security arrangements with the Indonesian military, which continues to commit severe human rights violations and suppress the political free speech. Journalists, humanitarian workers and researchers face restricted movement in the region, requiring remote methods of visualizing and reporting on the ongoing conflict. Until this present day, West Papua is still a no-go zone for foreign journalists or NGOs. 
no entrance without permission and supervision from the Indonesian government. Safe was Papua before it's too late. Blood and gold from West Papua. Yes. Safe as Papua before it's too late. That's something we, we, we say uh, 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 many times because we are very, very concerned about our, our, our people. Yeah? So we always, when we talk, please save our people from, from the suffering, save our people from ext uh, uh, extinction because that's what's coming. That's, what, that's the dark cloud we are seeing, we are witnessing every day in West Papua. Um, so, we, we want to talk about uh, the grass bed man because for us, the Spartans, that's the, the beginning of all suffering. Uh, as you have uh, heard, uh, the American company already signed an agreement before we got the chance to uh, vote, before the so called Act of Free Choice in 1969. The American Freeport Free Memorial, they signed an agreement with Suharto in 1967. It's two years before we got the chance to vote. So we should ask ourselves, is it, is it, is it, is it legal for America to extract copper and gold back then? Is it, is it illegal today? We are talking about profit, but for the Amuno people and the Komoro people, the customary grass, the customary land owners, the grass bread mountain is the sacred head of their mother. We say the, the land as our mother. So when they start digging, they are hurting our mother. That's how our, our people, the, uh, the, the, the Amuno and the Komoro tribe, see the whole situation. <laughs> yes, the Spapua is still an uh, occupied territory. That's how we, the Spapua see it. We don't uh, recognize the Indonesian illegal access to the Spapua. For many, it's a reality because they are there. They are sending troops, they are sending the military to West Papua. They are sending millions of transmigration to West Papua. But the Papua themselves, like myself and like many others, we don't, um, uh, uh, we reject, we reject the, uh, the annexation of our homeland. We don't acknowledge Indonesia as the, as, as the, as the uh, you know, it's the rightful owners of our country because it's our, we are the landowners. We never got the chance to actually uh, exercise our right to self determination. So, the grass bear, <coughs> Golden Coco Mine, is illegal um, in West Papua. It, it is being conducted without the, the consent of our people without the uh, approval of the Amuma and the Kamoro people. This is how the grassroots mine looks like from space. It's like a big hole. It used to be a mountain. There's a picture about how it uh, used to look like. As you can see on the left side from your uh, point of view, how it, how it started back in, uh, back in the uh, 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 70s. There used to be uh, uh, big mountains. First they found the edge bed, but then they realized that there's a bigger amount of gold and copper in the grass bed. So the grass bed was the second mountain, and this is how it's going. 
the mountain disappeared and it became a crater in the spiral. So this is this is how it looks now now in yeah, in the land of the Amumi and the Tamoro people. And yeah, we can we can ask ourselves where do all these people go? So since the sixties you can read about reports about military operations in that area because they needed to clear the area for this operation. A lot of military operation, operations was uh, taking place under the uh, Suharto regime. So people had to move. They grabbed the land, so they forcibly uh, intimidate people to leave the land so that they can freely conduct this mining operation. Economic profits versus ecological impact. Yes, when we are talking about mining, it's always about profit, it's always, always about making money. And this is you know, some results from uh, 2023. I hope you can read uh, the, 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 the data, copper and gold. For people, you know, we are talking about 30 million. $82,191.76 per day. That's, that's what they gained from Freeport. Only Freeport. We are not talking about timber. We are not talking about the MIFE project uh, in, in, in Mesos uh, customary land. We are not talking about gas and oil or fishery. No, we are only talking about one mine, the Grassberg mine. 30 million a day. against, it used to be 10,000 tons of toxic, which, which is now 300,000 tons of toxic every day that they are dumping in our rivers, which reach the sea. Can you imagine? No river can survive those kind of environmental violations, you know. Uh, so they, they did not only chase our people to leave the land, they also destroy our environment. They destroy our rivers, they destroy our, 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 our uh, mountains, they destroy the whole ecosystem. So for many people here in the Western world, it's just some trees and some uh, jungle. But for us, for our people, that's our supermarket. That's where we get our food. That's our pharmacy. That's where we get our medicine. So for many people, it's just some trees and some water, some river. But for us, we don't eat gold. We don't eat money. We live from the land. Our mother gave us the land. If you don't take care of your mother, you will have no food. You will have no life. So that's the profit and that's the impact of what Freeport McMoran and Indonesia is committing on a daily basis. In the land of the Amumen and Moro people. So uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard for us as activists to tell this kind of facts. But we are, it's, it's, it's our reality. You know, uh, we know that, uh, yeah, like City of Hamburg, <coughs> copper is not something new. Hamburg is also built, the economy is built by this kind of uh, trade. The West is trading on the blood and tears of our people. You know, when you trade in an occupied territory and you purposely turn a blind eye and don't see the human rights violations and you don't see the environmental violations. Yeah, so you are actually, you are, uh, the gold and the copper is actually made from blood. So the, the, the title is perfect, blood and gold from the spot one.
because your blood is full with our, as your goat is full with our blood. So that's the painful truth for my people. But like I said, it's not only gold, it's gas and oil, timber, fishery. Yeah. And for us, it's all about land grab. It's all about, about losing your land, being chased away by uh, military forces, uh, being forced to leave your country and try to find new life in somewhere else, in other areas, which can uh, result in conflicts with other tribes. <coughs> Those are the things that people do not realize, the impact on the, on the, on the, on the, on the ground, the impact on the ordinary people. But this is not the, 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 the thinking of the people who are making money, they only think about money. They want to make profit, of course. That's the Aqua River. <coughs> like I said, back in the days, 10,000 uh, tons of toxic every day. Now we are talking about 300,000 tons of toxic every day. That's a river, which now doesn't look like a river. <laughs> yeah. But who cares? It's just a river. But nobody's talking about the ecosystem, about our drinking water, about, you know, our, yeah, it's, it's a supermarket. What are those people going to eat? Uh, Jakarta wants us to eat rice. But before you came, before they came with the rice and, and the noodles, we already we had our own food. But now when you destroy our land, yeah, you force us to eat those food. But we have our own food. You know, people want us to change, they want us to forget who we are. But who has the right to do so? I don't have the right to come here and change you to be someone else. I don't have that right. And so does, uh, so does Indonesia. You don't have the right to change who we are. We don't have the right to change you. You may be uh, the one who, who he wants to be. But that's, that's the painful truth. That's the reality in Papua. This is one problem, but there are many problems, like in Mesos, uh, uh, that people, uh, his entire uh, wood, if you know the Mife project, it's very important for the palm oil industry. Many thousands, millions of acres, acres were bought and sold. I thought, I read something about five dollars for 100 uh, <laughs> acres. Five dollars, they bought five, for $5, they bought 100 acres from, from his people. And they lost their country and they are forced to flee. Uh, because when they stay, uh, this company, they hired the help from the Indonesian army and forced them or killed them on site if they refuse and try to fight back. So that's Mesu. That's why his father took the guns back in the days. Now his father today is one year ago. Until his end, he was still fighting for us. So, it's not only in Grasberg. <laughs> there are many problems in West Papua, but nobody seems to care. Beautiful picture. This is, this is our generation. This is, this is the reality now in Papua. This is how our, our children are sitting in the land, on the soil. They, are not, they don't know what the future is going to look like because they see the country, you know, it's very sad for me to look forward at this picture. For all these years, we not by slow genocide, they kill us not only by guns. For us, it's not safe to go to the hospital because when you go there, you can um, get sicker or you can even die. So for us, it's not good, safe to go there. They poison us. They drive us over by car. When you go to the garden, they can, you, they can kill you on spot without anything. When your father's going to the garden, and he might not come back home. And maybe you are lucky, you can find his body. But sometimes there's no care because you don't have a body. 
it, that's the reality for, for our children. Kikusai. Yes, that's also in West Papua. The destruction of our environment, that's also in West Papua. Indonesia doesn't care. It doesn't care eh, that West Papua is the second largest land of the earth, next, uh, besides the Amazon. They doesn't care. They just need to cut the trees, you know, like the MIFE project, they just cut the trees because palm oil is so important for the rest. So, ecocide is also in Papua. And we are also talking about ethnocide. <coughs> Indonesia tries to steal our, they steal our, they try to kill us, they steal our land, try to destroy our, our land. And now they are also trying to steal our culture, they try to steal our identity. Slowly by slowly. We are losing everything. So it started all with grass bed. It started all with the mining of copper and gold. And it's still going on because recently they have discovered another mountain and there's still some thing going on. They call it the Wabu Block. The Wabu Block gold mine. They say that it's bigger, it's bigger than the grass mine. So that's why uh, you can read some uh, reports about the Dugama and Tanjaya uh, tensions, uh, big military operations over there. They blame it to the uh, to to our liberation movement. They blame it to the freedom fighters. Indonesia calls them terrorists, but they are defenders. They are not attacking uh, Indonesia or whatever. They're taking people who are destroying the land and killing our people. So they blame it to uh, to the armed struggle, but actually they are defending our, our, our people. And because of this rubble block, um, more than sixty thousand uh, peoples are forced to refuge. That's what Henry was talking about. Mothers and children are forced to leave the villages and go uh, seek, seek for refuge in the jungle. And there are many reports of children being dead and mothers being dead. And the men are likely to join the, the struggle, of course. We don't have to accept somebody come and kill our mothers and children. <coughs> we don't have to accept that. When somebody come and uh, uh, come in your house and destroy everything, kills of kills your mother, kills your sister, your brother, why should we accept anything? The men, the boys, of course they will join the movement. Of course they will take the bows and arrows and fight against the Indonesian military with the modern guns, whatever. But it's our right, it's our country. We have the right to defend our country by any means. We are not fighting against them. We are not occupying Indonesia. Indonesia is coming and taking and destroying everything, killing all people. So why shouldn't I, why shouldn't we stand up and fight? For me being here, it's it's a privilege, it's it's a obligation. I stand here because he's not able to come here and tell you guys. He's the poisonous one. He's just sitting there looking around and he, he wonders whether his situation, whether he has a future in his own country. That's how he's just one, but there are many like him. And some, some of our children, they even sleep. They even have a good place to sleep. They sleep uh, in caves or under, under the, the, the feet of mountains. Sometimes they are, are being chased by the Indonesian military. And please never say Indonesian security forces. Because there are no security forces. We never feel security. We never feel secure in this weapon with their presence. Because they can kill us on sight. As soon as you walk with these kind of bags, no can, you can get arrested in Papua. Or you have a bracelet like you have. It's, it's not without risk. So that's why, thank you. Andrew, for this opportunity, I'd like to come and tell our stories. 
it's not because it's a beautiful story, uh, it, it's, it's a sad story, but I want to inform you and hope to inspire you to do something with your freedom, to, to do something, to write something, and tell people about, okay, I could I have heard this today about something is happening to the people of West Papua. Is that true? What can I do? What, what can our politicians do to help the people of West Papua? Of course, today we are all worried about uh, the people in Ukraine and the people in Gaza. You know, everybody, they deserve all our uh, sympathy and all our support. But what about us? Freeport was there since the 70s. The killing has been going on since then. We are talking about a slow genocide. Estimated 500,000 people uh, 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 being killed, uh, but nobody seems to care. So sometimes we 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 just cry, and uh, you know our mothers cry every day, and uh, our, our children they wonder if they have still have a future in their own country, and people like me and our elders are very worried about our own existence. Will we still be there in in, in 20 years, or are people? going to reach somewhere on the internet. There used to be a people from this color of skin with different hair living on this part of, 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 the, of the world. And yeah, that's, that's our nightmare, that's, that's, that's our greatest fear, but we never lose hope, we never lose hope, we never give up. We will do everything to defend our mother, our, our, our land, we will do everything to defend uh, our loved ones, just like you, I'm sure, you will do everything to defend your loved ones. If somebody comes and try to harm your loved ones, you will do everything to defend them, by any means. So, I hope that our story about the impact of a gold mine to my people, I hope that this story will inspire you to, to, yeah, to think positive about your being, about your existence, about your freedom. And let's hope that we all can do our part to change this world, to make this world a better place. And let's hope that uh, many years from now we can reflect back uh, home today and say, okay, that day, I realize that uh, I can do my part to make a better world. Thank you. This is this is uh, this one. Uh, this is one uh, one of our our our, our uh, views, our our dream of tomorrow. Because whenever Papua wants. We scream Papu Merdeka, Papu Freedom, okay, that's something we do purely and from the heart. But it's not only about Merdeka, it's not only about freedom. When freedom comes, we want the freedom to look like this. And this, this is our vision about a previous Papua. We want to make Ecocide, a, a serious criminal offense. Restoring guardianship of natural resources to indigenous authorities, combining Western democratic norms with local Papuan system. Yes, that's going to be a challenge, but this is something we think that's necessary, that needs to be done. We don't need to copy paste the Western way of decision making. Serving notice on all extraction companies, including oil, gas, mining, logging, and palm oil, require them to adhere to international environmental standards or cease operation. Yes, this, this would be one of our tasks, and that, that's, if it's up to us, we will do so. That's the Green State vision. It's on paper, it's a beautiful vision uh, for our people, but it's also a beautiful vision for the region and maybe also for the world. Because uh, West Papua is a nation of sharing. You know, we never think about 
we don't think that we care about ourselves because that's our weakness. We care too much and that's why people misuse our trust and enter our country and take everything. So that's the reason and I think that's that's the cause of my presentation. Thank you, Danke, Asumasa. If there are any questions, I hope I, it wasn't too fast, maybe it was too much uh, information uh, in 30 or 20 minutes or something. Maybe it's too much information, but if there are, there are questions, please do ask me a question and I will try to uh, give answer. If I cannot answer it directly, I will try to think and give, a, give an answer. Thank you. Questions uh, in Berlin or in, in the Bundestag uh, or maybe in Brussels to raise raise the issue because uh, actually human rights is a uh, is part of this uh, of this whole uh, criteria to, to, to have to, to have this free trade agreement. So for us, uh, maybe Indonesia should first invite the UN High Commissioner to visit us Papua to conduct a real uh, uh, fact-finding mission. Is it true? Is it true what the Papuans are saying? Is it true what the NGOs are saying? At least Indonesia should do that before they consider uh, the whole uh, free trade, uh, free trade uh, application. I think, yeah, the German people can do, can do that, can try to to ask, uh, you can ask your politician to write, or you know, um, maybe they can knock at some doors in Brussels, because Brussels is not always that easy to to bring forward some concerns. But uh, I'm sure that certain people do have the uh, the right uh, connections to knock on the right doors in Brussels, because as we know, that Commissioner, that Mr. Borrell, he is really changing his position. Uh, if it's if, if it's about Indonesia, he's very very very, you know, <laughs> he needs to be pushed to, 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 to stand firmly on what is right. So thank you for the question. So. I have a question. What do normal people in Indonesia think about the conflict? Um, normally, I, I think in the past, uh, a lot of Indonesian they don't know about what is happening. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, Indonesian students, they, they only read what the government has written in their history books. But they don't know what is happening uh, in West Papua. They don't understand why the Papuan people are standing up for their rights. They don't understand. And sometimes I wonder, do they know that their own government, the Suharto regime, killed almost two million Indonesians? In 1965, 60, uh, 1966, two million Indonesians, the same, so have to kill. I think a lot of Indonesians from this generation forgot about it. So we we do, you know, uh, in Paris, we do want to talk with Indonesians. You, know, you can't hate a people you don't know. You know, and uh, the midnight mission together, it's okay. Why, why, why they hate? Why do you hate us? We don't hate Indonesians, we just hate the system of oppression, we hate the system of colonization. So we hope that you know, changing is coming. We have friends like Surya Anta, Fereno Koman. They're not making friends in Indonesia, but those are the ones with lots of courage who are willing to stand up for what they believe is right. So it's not possible. It's not impossible because actually we, Papuans, we want to convince Indonesians first before we come here 
all the way to Europe and convince Europeans. You know, I'm here, so that's why I do this. But actually, we should convince Indonesians first because they are our neighbors. You know, but that's that's the that's the challenge, and it's the change is coming. Indonesians are realizing they know what's happening. Maybe some of them are getting fooled by this Opa Prabowo. He won the election by dancing, by TikTok, I heard. He was making this TikTok, the dancing grandpa, they call it. So uh, people, maybe the new generation, they didn't know what he had, what this Prabowo has done. But he's a war criminal. General Prabowo, he married with the daughter of Suharto. So he knows very well. And he was involved in many messages. <coughs> Not only in Istimo, he was involved in massacres in India, in my own country, and he was involved in Wamena bloodshed. So this is a war criminal and who, is, who has now become a president. So, yes, I think, I think the Indonesian people will stand up when they know that this Prabowo is not a happy dancing grandfather. He's actually a war criminal and the world will know. The world will find out about who this guy is, especially when he's going to work with Granto, he's going to work with the son of Iliono, all former generals. So, yeah, we are a little bit concerned about this new president, but actually maybe it's good, because, yeah, everybody will know that he's a war criminal. Sorry, maybe it was too much. <laughs> There are many Indonesians living in Papua. Do you make a difference between Indonesians and people from Maluku? Indonesians and people from Maluku. Uh, like some of these Maluku people are Christians and uh, Javanese are not. Or do you all put them in Indonesia? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I cannot judge you know, okay. because I, I grew up in, in Europe. Okay. But we don't make, we have uh, Indonesian friends, we have Moroccan friends. Uh -huh. And uh, I, don't, I don't want people to always to put us in this religious uh -huh. discussion because this is not a discussion of religion, this is a discussion of uh, humanity. Mm. You know, if, if a Christian is praying for me but kill me the next day, <laughs> what's, what's the, you know, yeah. what's the, What's the logic in it? So, uh, Moluccans, yeah, I have some some Moluccan friends. They are also fighting for their right to self determination. But I have also some Indonesian friends mm -hmm. who understands where I'm coming from and where the, who understands why I am uh, I'm an activist or why I am standing for the right of the people. So it's not about okay. you know, uh, it's not against the Indonesian people. It's against the system of communication. Nobody. Uh, can you maybe tell us again? I forgot the number. What is the percentage of the Indonesian budget that comes from uh, Grasberg? Budget. I think, you know, all, all the money that Indonesia earns. I know that I don't a have big, the... big part came from Grasberg. Yeah, like I said, it's 30 million. A part of it goes to the United States, of course. Sure. But, uh, uh, the, Most the, of it goes to Jakarta. Most of Jakarta right now, because now they have the the the, the, the presidents. Jakarta is more than uh, more than U.S. But it's still uh, we are more than the half of 30 thousand, uh, 30 million a day. Mm. So that, that that that's just Westbury, but. There are a lot of, uh, and we are not talking about illegal, illegal lodging or illegal that mining. That comes on top, yes. That yes. comes on top. And our people are the ones who have to flee, who have to fear for their lives. So, yeah, I, actually I don't, yeah, it's, it's very painful to talk about profits when it comes to man, uh, life, human lives, you know what I think? I'm not a, I'm not a businessman, I don't think like a businessman, I don't think in terms of money or profit, I think, I think as a freedom fight, I, freedom is everything. Without freedom, there's nothing for our people, so, yeah. Who's working in the mine? Rocky? Where, uh, who is working in the mines? Oh, the there are, are, are foreigners, 
There are foreigners, there are a lot of Indonesians working there. There are some Papuans working there uh, in the mine, but uh, there are also foreigners, people from America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they are also working there. Uh, and, 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 and Freeport is paying a lot of money for their protections. So sometimes when you read things on the internet about some class uh, in the region, uh, we should ask ourselves, is it really the Papuans who are attacking or is it someone uh, t trying to create uh, an unsafe condition so that their presence is needed? Because they got 20 million, 20 million uh, dollars a year for their protection. That's what I read somewhere. But 20 million a year? For the TNI, for the Indonesian Army, it's, I think that's a lot of money for, for some. <laughs> so, yeah, foreigners and Papuans, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know where they have, they have to look, they have to work to find a living for their families. So, but it's not about that, it's about the, uh, the killing and the destruction of our environment. Okay. Um, what about your other neighbor, Papua New Guinea? How complicit are they in this? Well, Papua New Guinea um, uh, recently they started to uh, raise their concern about their neighbor. Actually, PNG, Papua New Guinea, we are one race. We are many nations. We are one people. But because of the former colonizers, they drew a line. This is Papua New Guinea, this is West Papua, but we are actually one people. But that some, somehow we understand the position. They are afraid of Indonesia. They are afraid of the Indonesian military forces. That's why PNG is very, very careful in everything what they say politically. But solidarity is there. But we, West Papua, we need more than solidarity. We need some action to actually save save, save our, our people's life on the western part of the island. But PNG is uh, having talks with, with uh, uh, President Joko Widodo, so they're having talks. So for us, okay, it's a good start, but we expect more from our brothers. So we said uh, to our friends, okay, it's good, you have talks, maybe you can put some sense to Jokowi, to the Indonesian uh, government, maybe they can realize and they have talks about military uh, cooperation uh, but they also have talks about the UN High Commissioner visit. They promised to grant access since 2018, since the former, former UN High Commissioner. But uh, every, uh, every time, each time there's something for them to use it, uh, as an excuse not to grant access. What do you have to hide? Why is that not possible? For If there's nothing to hide in West Papua, if there's nothing going on, why you, why don't you just let the UNI Commissioner to come and conduct a fact-finding mission in those regions? You don't have to go visit the whole Papua. Just go to Nugama in Tanjaya, the places where you did, said that there's an uprising. And please go there. You don't have to talk with all the people. Just go talk with our mothers. Talk with our mothers in those area. You will find out the truth. Talk with our mothers because they are the ones who can tell about the pain, about the crime. So as long as, yeah, sorry, it was only about PNG, but yeah, okay. we are happy that PNG is having talks with uh, President Jokowidodo and talks with uh, Red Norman Sugi, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. It's, it's a step forward, but PNG, yeah, our people, Papuan people expect more from PNG because we call ourselves one talk. That's our Melanesian brother. But it's very difficult to accept them. Just say, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, but, you know, I, and, and then I can do this. Okay, that's fine. Do you know what they are afraid of? Like, does Indonesia have any power over uh, Papua New Guinea at the moment? Or are they afraid they will attack? Or what do you think is their well, concern? Yeah, if you look at the statistic, Indonesian military is very, very powerful in the, in the region. Okay. So and are they still stationed there? They're stationed at the border. Okay. Of, um, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of military operations. 
uh, in the border, uh, borderline. Yes, I'm not trying to put down the PNG Defence Force, but it's not. It's you cannot compare the PNG Defence Force with the Indonesian Army. It's they got the support from America. They buy weapons from China, Russia, United States, Europe. They buy tanks from Germany. Yes. You know they couldn't buy. We managed to to stop them in, in, the, in the Netherlands, but they did, uh, divert and they bought tanks from Germany. But you know actually we are not that scared in Papua for the tanks because you cannot come with your tanks to our mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's that's one thing. You know, uh, PNG is very afraid of. Indonesia because Indonesia is a military power. Of course, they have the right to defend their, their people, their nation. So, uh, but I think they have the, the money they buy from what they stole from our country. So when we talk to Indonesian diplomats, so don't talk too much. You have an offense in Mercedes Benz, but it's paid by our gold. That's what we uh, tell to the Indonesian diplomats when they try to mock. Yeah, you're driving, you're wearing fancy clothes, but where do you get the gold from? So I think that's the reason why PNG is scared, because Indonesia is great military power in the region. What do you think about the future? Are you hopeful? Uh, if I was not hopeful, I wouldn't stand here. <laughs> you know, and um, you know, uh, one thing is what, what we we uh, uh, um, are on We are very hopeful because we know that our strongest weapon is not not the newest rocket or rocket launcher or, uh, um, guns. Our weapon, our greatest weapon is our song, our guitar, and our weapon is uh, art. That's what we used to uh, inform people. That's what we use against the darkness. You know, um, we see we see hope as a spark of light, as a candlelight, and we see the Indonesian aggression as the darkness, which is crying. So sometimes it seems very dark. You know, it it seems like there is no hope because oh, Indonesia is too strong, the military is too big, oh, the Kopassus, the special forces is too violent. We should be scared, but if there's one person which is a candlelight in this darkness, there will always be hope. So, of course, we will believe until none of us exist, then there will be no, no hope. But as long as I can read, my brothers, my sisters, as long as we can read, I know we will fight, we will be that candlelight for our people to shine a light in their darkness. So, you can also be that kind of like for your people, for your family. So it's 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 yeah, it's up to you. How do you see life? You want to sit down and await the darkness, or you want to shine light on yeah, on your family and your other loved ones. Finished, but you say there's a new Wabu block. The Wabu block. Do you think the Indonesians can exploit this without Western engineers? I think they have the potential because they were already talking years ago. They were already talking about building a smelter in. Oh, without the Americans, without Canadians. Why not? If wow. they can, they can okay. make their own guns. They can, yeah. Of course, they can try to. If China can do it, why not Indonesia? But uh, yeah, the Wabu block, you can Google, you can look up the, the Wabu block mine. That's another bigger mine. And that's the main source of problem in the prison conflicts in Ndugama and in, Tandai, in Tanjaya. So when you read things about some military tension, it's about, it's about, about gold. So it's, it's the real avatar. If you know the first edition of avatar, when the world went to this planet in search of generals, it was in that movie. The real avatars in was Papua. You know, this, this rich, uh, richness in natural resources is actually, is actually our, our, our curse. Yes. 
You will be free once all, yeah, all, all is gone. All is gone and they will give us freedom. Yes. We will have then we will sit on the mountain of rubbish. Rubbish. Yeah. We will live on the Polichita River, yeah. on the sea. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a life. Life should be, yeah, you should live your life. So. <laughs> when your mother is dead, your dad is gone. There's no life. Like I said, we don't, we cannot eat gold. We cannot eat money. But we can, we can show you go to a garden and find some food and drink water. We hope that we can still drink water. I hope one day the world will realize that you cannot eat money or gold. I hope that one day before, <laughs> before it's too late. I hope you, a lot of people in the world will realize that uh, actually you don't have to destroy things to make money and uh, try to go to, do, to find life in, in somewhere in the space. Uh, try to do things to protect the earth you live on, you know. I think uh, it's not that difficult to, to come. It takes less money to preserve nature than to build rockets to go to find water somewhere. <laughs> so that's, that's um, yeah, I, maybe, maybe they call us here uh, uh, primitive people, but I think, yeah, that's the most logical thing to think about, uh, yeah. Protect, protect uh, the mother, protect our, uh, our planet, and yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. And life is more than about gold and money. <laughs> life is about life. Thank you. <laughs> we are uh, close with one song. Uh, I would like to share this song, uh, Mystery, Mystery, Mysterious Life, Mystery Hidu. This is uh, my father's last song. If you know my story, uh, my father got uh, killed in 1984. And before he got killed, he wrote this song, Mysterious Life, Mystery Hidu. He wrote this song behind the Indonesian bars. So for me, it was always difficult to sing this song because every time when I sing this song, it brings me to his jail, jail cell. I imagine him writing this song, knowing that he was going to die. And this is a message he left, uh, not only for his sons, uh, his wife, and his unborn son, my youngest brother, Rati, never met my father. But this is a song he left for his people. And this song is still uh, uh, the symbol of hope in our struggle. Our activists, our, our elders, our, my generation, the new generation, every time when they feel down, every time when they are afraid, they sing this song. Especially, especially the chorus. Yang kundamba, yang kundamba, up, uh, everything, I don't know what's, uh, everything I have experienced, everything I'm going to experience, everything, it's nothing for nothing less than for freedom. So this this song is is a, a, is a beacon of hope for my people. We only sing this song when we feel weak, when we feel left behind. And I want to share with you. Mr. Andrew.